with that is our United States government has a long reach. And so this is why we need awareness and fighting on this. And this is an issue where we could take this up as a, as a movement, as a party. I mean, this could, be, this could be very big for us because there are already a lot of people who feel very strongly. This was the biggest effort that Congress ever saw. This is not small. So it might be we want to think about that. Yes? Um, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with uh, what the AARP has been doing and politicized over the past number of years, working for socialized medicine. I was wondering if you might be able to comment on the AMA and the AA, the American Association of Physicians and Surgeons, the difference between them and how the AMA is becoming politicized too. I don't know if you want to get into that. Yeah. Well, you know, um, the question and comment is about uh, the AMA and um, and other other groups and how they become politicized. The AMA really began the movement for what they called professional birth control back in the 30s. What they did is they wanted regulations governing physicians, uh, and and they wanted to control the medical schools through these uh, these uh, governing boards, uh, approval boards, and they were successful. And they reduced the number of physicians down very far, and the reason they wanted to do that was so the price that the physicians could charge could go up. And they were very successful at that. And that's, uh, I think just now they're starting to wake up to the fact that they may have hung themselves, because of course now a lot of physicians are saying, I can't afford to have a practice anymore with all of the legal liability that I have from these lawsuits, that's a whole other story, and I, I can't afford Medicare patients anymore because the government's now cut back on what they're going to pay me, and if I take Medicare patients, I can't take patients that pay me cash. So, you know, there's a lot of difficulty there, and I, I hope they're going to wake up. Now, the American Association for Physicians and Surgeons is a, a much different organization. It's for freedom in medicine, and it's out of Tucson, I believe. <coughs> Uh, could someone bring me my water, please? And that's a great group. They understand. And there's somebody that, if you don't aren't aware of, you should be. I think it's aapsonline.org. They're a great group. They have a great newsletter. And they have lots of book reviews on, on books that you'll want to know about and avoid. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, in the back. What is the MAPS model? I'm not familiar with the acronym. It's a multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. They've been conducting studies, barely getting government approval, but occasionally getting government approval through the administration of uh, psychedelic drugs, mostly in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you don't know about MAPS, I guess I'm just wondering more generally where you think psychedelic drugs might fit into the, the regulatory model or, or uh, how they compare and contrast with uh, more traditional psychoactive drugs. Well, I'm not familiar with MAPS, but I believe that Treatment with any kind of drug, the psychedelics or whatever, um, certainly would be looked into more in a different type of model. Right now, the FDA can basically squash any drug development program just by saying they don't find it politically correct. I mean, they don't say it that way, but that's basically what happens. And that's what is happening, and that's why the people you're referring to have a hard time getting funded or getting the study off the ground. Um, yeah, I think it's still pretty much against the law to do studies on marijuana, for example. It's very, very difficult to do that. And, and any attempt to do that is, is met with a lot of uh, red tape, at least. Like quote, dangerous. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, just on that last point, I think even the uh, AAOP, the pediatricians, were uh, joining in one of the advocates' briefs against tomorrow night's speaker. But I wanted to, to ask you a follow-up question uh, on your comments about the IP protections. Mm -hmm. The, um, the, the understanding I have of what you were saying a few moments ago uh, is that it's essentially a matter of the goodwill that's been built up between when the drug company brings it to market and when the generic comes out. And I can understand that of compensating for 20%, you 30% know, markup. I don't see it compensating for 200%, 300% price differential. So is, is what you're saying then that that intermediary period before the generic comes on market is where all of the R&D costs would be earned back? Uh, and if so, um, what, what kind of uh, limitation do you see that presenting uh, to the R&D expenditure for each drug and, and is that presenting limit? 
Yes, uh, it's uh, okay. The question is about um, the big difference between generics and new drugs that come out, and is that period, that short period, where the drug company has to recover the costs? And the answer, the short answer is yes, that is the period, but they aren't just recovering for that one that's on the market. They're recovering for the 10 failures that also cost them, you know, millions of dollars. And that's, that's where things get tricky because uh, there are many drugs that are effective and are safe, but they never make it to market because the cost of developing them is so high that they won't be able to recover their costs. Um, I think the last study I saw, and I have to admit it's about 10 years old, was that only 3 out of 10 new drugs recover their costs. So what you're really paying for in, in any particular drug that's successful is you're paying for all those failures. But with that being the case, mm -hmm. and, and I would love to believe that we can get rid of the patent laws. There's, there's so many problems with the patent office that, that you know, it, it defies belief. But from what I'm hearing you say there, uh, that's not entirely consistent with that because you know, if you want to be putting together a drug that's going to take a lot of R&D for that and for the other 10 studies that fail, isn't it more effective nowadays, isn't it, I should say, isn't it easier nowadays to reverse engineer a drug that comes out and produce a generic based on that? And isn't that time window between the presentment of the, uh, the original company's drug and the generics climbing on board going to be that much shorter if you don't have patents? Okay, well, I think, I think maybe there's a little bit of confusion about my point there, and I'm, I'm sorry I was unclear. The reason that we have to have patent protection today is because development costs are so high that the only way they can be recovered is through a monopoly system, which is what the patent system is. <coughs> However, in the days when development costs were much less, you didn't need that monopoly protection. You got first the market, if you were lucky, and you knew you'd recover your costs and make lots of money, and then your competitors actually would come in with their second to the market and third to the market, and they would take a small percentage of your market, maybe 5-10%, but it would be enough because the development costs were so low. But today they aren't. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible to recover them. I would say it's impossible to recover them without the patent protection. So the regulations have made patent protection necessary. This has always been a dilemma for me since, uh, I, I, for example, I uh, developed a cream. I had, I had breast cancer, I had to have radiation treatment. And, and I knew when talking to the other women that I was going to be in big trouble because I burned very easily. So I developed a cream that protected me from that. And then my neighbors started using it for their cuts and bruises and things like that, and I found it worked against wrinkles, <laughs> scars, um, a lot of other things, uh, certain types of tumors. So now I have this dilemma, you know. Do I patent it so it can be developed and... and people can use it, or do I not patent it and not be able to develop it? You see, it's a, it's a dilemma. <laughs> Throw it at your table outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just trying to, yeah, and this is a very personal example of how, you know, how that, it gets all twisted, you know? It's, uh, it's very difficult. Okay? Yes, over there, you've had your hand for a long time. And this whole idea of, of the, these undue influences in the codex, um, I was wondering, What's your opinion on the influence drug companies have had since they've been allowed to advertise on TV or at mass market advertising? It seems to have only increased their influence to the detriment of, you know, say, natural health. Do you, do you see a, I'm curious as a libertarian, would you be in favor of putting the rules back that they couldn't, you couldn't advertise prescriptions to the mass market? Well, um, the question was, what do I think about advertising to the direct to the consumer advertising that drug companies do today? And there's been some studies done on this, which are very interesting. And those studies show that when the drug companies can advertise, people go, oh, well, I didn't realize there was a treatment for this condition, or I didn't realize this was serious, so I'll go in and 